welcome to uh, this December 2020 TGIF. Why are we so polarized? Um, just by way of an introduction, uh, you are in many ways being invited to an experiment. I think the experiment is, can we have a non-polarized discussion around this? Um, the obvious trap to avoid is obviously um, that uh, we're not talking about them polarizers out there, right? So like uh, those people who polarize versus us who are better than that. That would be the obvious trap to avoid. We're talking about us. Um, and uh, perhaps also just by a disclaimer is a, um, it's not a disclaimer, uh, an acknowledgement that this is based on a uh, discussion of a small group of friends that we had the other week. Um, and I'm using some of the learnings from that. In terms of a definition, um, polarization, what I mean and uh, maybe don't only mean, I don't, when we're talking about polarization, we, I think we don't only mean this. So this is the um, famous Time magazine cover of last year showing how we are uh, the world's most unequal country. And so clearly there is contrast there and, um, and, and there's a polarity there. But I think when we're talking about polarization, we're talking about more than that. I think we're also talking about more than this, the fact that this is a you know, chart from the US, how um, people who vote Democrat and people who, who vote Republican have moved apart in their uh, thinking over the years. So it may be all that, but it's, it's more than that. So it's not merely the existence of various forms of inequality. It's not just having very different opinions and convictions and values. It's also not being able to engage each other anymore. Yeah? So it's also about not actually being able to take the other side seriously anymore. Um, and, uh, working with the assumption that somebody who's on the other side has got to be either an idiot or a monster. Okay? So um, got to be either stupid or evil. Right? And as a result of that, the, the breakdown of, of constructive discourse. So uh, just an attempt to uh, locate what it is that we're talking about today. And then, of course, there are various dimensions in which we then manage to polarize ourselves. That's probably not a complete list. Um, but now, when we're getting to why are we polarized, I think we can try and offer explanations at different levels. Now, at the sort of at the top level, we can say things like, yeah, but it's, it's social media or we're trading in stereotypes. And that is that is very true. But I'm wondering whether we're actually digging deep enough with those answers. Okay, so we're trading in stereotypes, but why are we doing that? Um, social media, yes, um, you know, if there's any doubt, if you haven't seen a Social Dilemma on Netflix, do, do watch that. Um, social uh, media does need to change. But in so many ways, social media is us, right? So we can't just sort of blame it on the technology or the algorithms. Um, there's something about us that we need to dig to. If we then go almost like to a very, very foundational level of explanation, then we might say things like, okay, well, we're sinful or people are selfish or we are selfish. Now, again, that is um, very true. That is very valuable. Actually, it's key to sort of um, work out what happens at the most foundational level. One of, the re one of the ways we polarize is actually that we're not agreed on what's at the bottom. But in itself, in terms of trying to make progress with regard to this particular issue, you can see this is too coarse grained, right? It doesn't actually yet offer some uh, practical guidance with regard to uh, this issue that we're facing. So what I'm going to be trying to do today is just sort of try and cover um, explanations that are somewhere in the, in the middle between too superficial and too foundational. Um, by way of introductory comments also, I mean, I, um, we can have a discussion around social media. Let's make that a discussion for another day. Um, in many ways, uh, social media is, uh, um, yes, as a byproduct or even by intent, we can have that discussion also uh, um, uh, has an effect on, on the polarization issue. But um, in many ways, it's also just an amplifier. Okay? So it, it amplifies what we back to us, what we already have. So. Um, if we say fake news travels six times faster than truth, we can't only blame the algorithm, okay? It's also the algorithm just gives us what we want. <laughs> so we got to have a look at us. 
And I think another thing to acknowledge is, um, is in terms of polarization, we do face a particular challenge. So our current hangover in many ways bears witness to a, to a very troubled history um, in which we had very real, not just imagined polarization. Okay? It was a real war, real bullets uh, flying, real blood. And also um, uh, it was a time in which the majority of the population was silenced or at least not heard. So now as over the years and, you know, things, you know, as we unpack this, things keep coming up, don't they? And, um, and obviously it's going to lead us to a place where we need to have the difficult conversations. And um, those conversations do have the potential of polarizing us and we need to ver work very hard that it, uh, that it doesn't do that, that we, um, that we keep engaging them and, uh, and running away from the conversation is actually a way of polarizing. So we need to have those. Um, so a few possible dynamics uh, in, uh, in sort of at the middle levels. Here are my three categories for today. Why did I choose these three categories? Well, they just seem suitable just to, to group thoughts. Um, those categories aren't um, neatly separate. They flow into each other. They are totally related, but just a way of grouping um, possible explanations for um, polarization and the dynamics behind that. So in terms of the first one, with values, I mean, just the, um, the attitude or the stance or the disposition or the demeanor that we have in um, uh, conversations, in, in uh, relationships with other people. Um, it's what I assume about the other. And at that level, um, I think we've all noticed this, right? Uh, we, it's easy to be, to be quick to, to presume, to prejudge, to know so much about a person and then fill in the blanks. There are many, many blanks. Okay, I only have a few dots and I, I, I um, very quickly connect the dots. And um, often what we fail to do is, is to give benefit of the doubt or also uh, fail to give second chances because, I mean, we all fluff up, right? Um, and I'm sort of wondering, well, you know, do we have to do that? Okay, that is, that is the one that's very much in our control. Um, do we, we, we don't have to choose this way of engaging or perhaps better said disengaging. Um, it's also that that probably um, is, invites misunderstandings very easily. Okay, if I don't listen properly, if I'm quick to presume, then obviously um, that's, uh, that's the breeding ground for misunderstandings. And that again um, is, uh, is a recipe for polarization. Um, then also the idea of the discussion with someone else. I don't know if you've, uh, if you've, I'm sure you've experienced this. Okay, you're having a, um, a discussion with someone, but it's almost like what they are saying. Um, they're not actually engaging with you. They're probably engaging with someone who looks like you. <laughs> um, and you can see what's happening there. It's again, it's the, it's the, it's, it's the presumption of you know. Um, I said, I said a particular word. And then there's all sorts of um, presumptions that uh, 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 rest of package that is being assumed. Um, and there's no doubt in my mind that I have done the same to others. Okay, so somebody says, I don't know, uses a word like whiteness or uses a phrase like, uh, yes, but all lives matter. And then um, chances are one of those worked for you and the other one didn't, right? And then you immediately, you know, when somebody says that, you immediately assume a total package. And I think the thing to take care of, of course, is um, not to prejudge and to let every person be every person um, and, and to let every person be unique. Um, and then also the, um, the phenomenon of the silent middle. Okay, so uh, why are we so polarized? Well, one of the reasons perhaps is that the um, people at the polls are the ones who are loud. And then there might be a lot of people in the middle um, that don't say very much. And I presume we have good reason not to, okay, because you know, it's not fun to be run over from both sides. And I think that's why we, why we stay quiet. Um, but, um, you know, uh, is uh, not speaking up actually always the, the, the best thing to do? So perhaps also what we are finding is that phenomenon of, uh, of the silent middle. And we need to ask why um, is the middle silent? Then moving on to the next level, um, the level of emotions. Again, I have, uh, I have three sub uh, headings over here so very briefly on each one 
um, the idea of feeling being the new knowing. Okay, so um, how do I know things? Well, um, yeah, through my, increasingly, it's through my intuition or, or my feelings guide me. Okay? If something resonates with me, then it's got to be true. If something doesn't sit well with me, well, then it's got to be wrong. Um, and um, so what I'm then guided by is, um, yeah, but basically by my, by my instincts, by my gut reaction. Now, if you notice what would, what's happening in that sort of, if, if we, yeah, um, I suppose function in that way is that we actually, our morality is actually defined at the level of yak and yum. Right. So um, if something, you know, uh, something is yak, it's got to be wrong. So I say murder yak in a similar way as I might say broccoli yak. And, and, and that's what makes m murder wrong. It repulses me. Now, there's, I mean, there's obviously there's a there's a at least half truth to that. OK, if something's wrong, I, I should expect it not to sit uh, uh, well with me. Um, if something's right, I should expect it to resonate with me. But it's a question of which way around the arrow goes, isn't it? So um, it isn't right because it sits well with me. Um, it's uh, um, it's because it's it's because it's right that it sits well with me. Do you see the difference? Okay. Um, so uh, in a way, if that is the way I make my moral or ethic, ethical judgments and choices, it's actually a little bit of a shortcut mor morality. Okay, because I'm actually shortcutting, doing the hard work of uh, going deep down and thinking and, and, and working out some complex issues. And I'm just going for, okay, well, does this sit well or doesn't it sit well? And then there might also be the phenomenon, I'm just speculating a little bit, I can't prove this to you, of um, you know, if, if um, emotion is um, not just a guide, but the guide uh, in, in my life, then um, the temptation is obviously, um, you know, where, the, the greater the con, uh, emotion, the greater the conviction. Okay, so where do I get my convictions from? Is I then go to to the stronger emotion and to that which evokes that stronger emotion. I hope that makes some sense. Um, there's a, um, a French uh, prof, uh, Chantal de Sol in Icarus Fallen, um, talks about a morality of sentimentality or an ethics of complacency. So complacency, the, the idea of not doing the hard work and just letting um, something, uh, um, yeah, a little more, a little bit less nuanced guide me. Um, then also in terms of the emotions layer, um, the fear factor. I think fear is a huge item. Um, why? Because we do, I mean, this is all of us, right? We do have a discomfort with anything that that is other. Okay, so, so there's something, if, if everything is nicely the way I have it and the way I'm used to and the way I grew up, then then that's my comfort zone. But as soon as there's something other that blows our boundaries, it disturbs our identities, it leads to identity insecurity. Um, and um, it, that again leads to territoriality uh, in a sense of, okay, so now, you know, this is this is too strange. And especially in an, in an uncertain and changing and, and in some ways scary uh, world and time, you know, I'm sort of trying to carve out my sort of bubble of, you know, at least, you know, stay out. I, I just want to make this place feel like, feel like me and feel like home. Um, so I suppose what I'm trying to say is territoriality isn't, it's not necessarily malicious, right? It's like, you know, don't, don't, don't step in, <laughs> leave my sanctuary alone. It's mine. Okay. It's a, it's a self-preservation thing in, in some, to some extent as well. Um, and then I think uh, I have this one from, from you, Steve, don't I? Uh, the, the idea of, uh, you know, are we also falling for personality cults? Um, there is something about, you know, we tend to follow the polarizers because let's, let's be honest, for some reason, moderate isn't very exciting. And so it's the people that, you know, do the weird stuff on the fringes where we sort of, you know, that, that, that's what resonates. And there again, I'm wondering whether... Um, the, the, our heroes aren't in some ways a, a shortcut morality. So instead of doing the hard work, I just say, yeah, you know, what he said or um, uh, you know, I, whatever, whatever this person evokes in me, that's, that resonates, that's what I want to follow. 
So I basically then almost by proxy take on certain values and convictions. And the mere fact that I am uh, um, part of that tribe, that I'm following this person, and, and that we are following um, him or her together um, is also a, almost like a, a way of fostering identity and belonging. Um, so I think that's one of the dynamics at play here as well. Okay, so apologies, this is probably one of those uh, tossed and trying to fit too much into one talk thing, but let's move on. Um, then at the, at the level of beliefs, again, three points, and um, I might have bitten off a little bit um, uh, more than one can chew through on this, but let me try work through it. The one is our, um, our belief about power, how power is brokered, uh, what a resource is and how that works. So I think we can acknowledge that, especially if um, we're sort of functioning more at the survival level, um, you know, if we have competition at survival level, I mean, that does tend to polarize us. And that's where we get all the, you know, conquer, colonize, control type of dynamics from. The question, of course, becomes, does it have to be that way? So even if, if times are tough, um, do they need to polarize us? Isn't there still a way that we can find each other and work together to solve something? So in terms of our beliefs, um, how does power work? How do resources work? Are resources zero sum? Now, some might be. Okay? So land, for example, is probably a resource that is zero sum. Okay? Whatever land you have, I don't have. But many resources aren't. Um, for for me to gain more skills, you don't have to give up those skills. So if we do some of the thinking, a lot of things, more things than we might initially suspect might actually be win-win. It doesn't always have to be lose-lose. And then there are different ways that people have described this, okay? Uh, scarcity thinking versus normally people say abundance thinking. I'm not even 100% convinced about that because not everything is abundant, let's be, let's be honest. So I'm calling it stewardship thinking, okay? Um, managing well that which we have been entrusted with. Um, you may have uh, read something or, or, or seen something on fixed mindset versus growth mindset. It's that sort of thing, okay? With what sort of mindset do we, um, do we operate as we um, navigate the world? Um, then storyline. I think is important. Which story uh, do we live in? Because here's here's a I suppose controversial thing to say: not all stories are equal. Okay, they're not not equally good. They're not equally true. Um, in terms of uh, this is very simplistic, but um, just briefly, um, if one compares uh, modernism, postmodernism, and biblical and Bible. Um, in, I've got some of this from Miroslav Wolf, but please don't blame him for my um, distortions of this. Okay, but uh, so in the typical modernist story, um, the the storyline is basically one of liberation from some form of oppression to freedom. Now that, that oppression may be colon it doesn't have to be colonization. One of the big candidates for oppression is also religion. Okay, that we need to free ourselves from. Um, in a more postmodern setting, um, where we're moving is from uh, people who are making absolute truth claims and uh, pronouncing meta narratives, you know, these big universals. And through tolerance, we want to get to a place where everybody's able to have their own truth and their own storyline. Um, and then uh, the biblical one, perhaps being a journey from exclusion to embrace. So here I lean on uh, Miroslav Wolf's book, uh, Exclusion and Embrace, um, and the journey is one of love. Now, forgive me again for putting something up that I can't now, you know, spend, spend half an hour on, but just to make the point that um, not all stories um, fare equally in terms of polarization or, or, or bringing us together. So they, um, you know, we, we can find um, or, or, or the, the ones on the outside do struggle with uh, not polarizing in a way that perhaps the middle one, if properly followed, uh, doesn't. So um, I think the, the, the one on, um, on the left is pretty clear. So um, in, in that story, I probably have to divide the world into oppressor and oppressed. Um, and you can see how that immediately uh, creates a boundary. And then on the tolerance one, 
um, there's, a, there's a right and a wrong or a healthy and an unhealthy way of understanding tolerance. So rightly understood, tolerance is absolutely essential to human relationships, but we can get it wrong. And when we get it wrong, it can also be a recipe for polarization. Um, and brief attempt to show the difference. Healthy tolerance is about seeing all people as equally valuable. Unhelpful tolerance requires us to see all ideas as equally valid. Okay, so you see the difference. So is, is tolerance about uh, um, the value of people or is it about um, create, uh, use, um, declaring ideas to be equally valid? And I'm wondering whether one of the dynamics is um, increasingly um, to differ with a person's idea is becoming equivalent to rejecting them as a person. And you can see how that is unhelpful and how that uh, polarizes. Uh, in that sort of setting, if you're in any way exclusive about ideas, you become excludable as a person. There's your polarity right there. Um, and tolerance must be about equality of, um, of persons, not equality of ideas. It must allow us to differ from each other and then to treat well those we differ with. And I think it's this person-centered kind of tolerance that is the one that's going to meet our deep human need to get along with each other. Um, and then lastly, as I said, I'm probably being brave on this one, but uh, just to um, put a brief <laughs> mention of um, uh, the identity lens or identity theory or identity politics, but I think that is one of the uh, key dynamics in um, polarization. So the idea of um, identity theory is that I understand human interaction largely in groups and their relationship and how between the groups power is uh, um, brokered and perhaps also abused. And because um, it's, it, it tends to be group focused, it tends to result, maybe it doesn't have to, but frequently we notice this, don't we? We, uh, we, we then start developing low resolution, high contrast views of the other because we pixelate everything and we turn everything into uh, so many things into binaries and frequently immutable binaries. In other words, binaries that can't change. So for example, white, black, I mean, that's, it's not something we're gonna change. Um, and if we don't watch it, what we do is we um, reduce others, instead of naming things and naming people, we just label. So a, a, a name holds the fullness of every everything uh, that you are and who you are. A label reduces uh, uh, each other to a single attribute and usually not a very flattering attribute. Um, I keep forgetting who this comes from, but I've been, yeah, I just found this so helpful. The idea of when we're talking about identity, the key question is what is it about our identity that goes all the way down? Do you get the metaphor, right? So there, there are all sorts of things that are important about our identity, but what, what goes all the way down? What's at the, at the very core, so to speak. Um, and this is, uh, it's important here because if you think about now the dynamics of what's happening, if, my, if I believe that my core is something that I don't believe I have in common with you, okay, so uh, whether it's, you know, defining my, uh, the, the core of my identity on age or gender or race or whatever, okay, so if that is uh, what goes all the way down for me um, and you are not like me in that regard, you can immediately see how then in our interactions uh, that becomes difficult, then how do I not see you sooner or later as a threat of, um, of some kind? And then if you challenge me on that and say, but what if that's not your core identity? Um, the way it comes across to me is that I feel invalidated. Does that, does that make sense? I think that's one of the key dynamics. There is also the dynamic sometime where then uh, identity can also be become weaponized, not just to get attention, but also power. But I think even without that dynamic, um, identity um, you know, is, a, is a key driver in this. And then um, uh, 
I think increasingly um, you can probably find some uh, uh, some articles and writings on that, and I'm leaning on a combination of two people uh, over here. Is um, in terms of the identity, we have it's almost like we have a new religion on the block. So we've we've rejected traditional religion, but that leaves us with an intense spiritual hunger, and then we're saying, well, what's the outlet for that hunger? And it's not only um, that that is unmet, but then it's also this void where we actually no longer agreed on who we are and what that means. And now we have to frantically go and start uh, self redefining. Okay, there's the identity thing. And, um, and this is speaking into the American context, but I don't think it's just US. Then people transfer what used to be their religious beliefs and habits and passions, and they then transfer it into the political realm, infusing politics with a religious mindset. I mean, you can see this person obviously sees religion in a very negative sense, right? In the worst of religion. And um, I mean, you, you, you may have read some of the stuff how uh, people are almost like uh, comparing this new mindset to, to a religion. And not to a very good religion, right? To the to the worst of religion. I think you can you can read some of that. Um, now, often this is a critique more of the sort of the new left and sort of you know um, taking the wokeness thing too far. But um, I think there's a there's a other side version, a right version to that as well. Okay, where we perhaps um, um, traditional religion hasn't been shunned, but has been confused for it means belonging to a certain tribe or subculture or political party. So I don't think it's, you know, the, um, it's a phenomenon just on the one side. It's a, it's a phenomenon all over. One key thing to notice, and again, I'm sorry for being brief and not um, motivating all of these things sufficiently, is um, what's frequently, what, what, what this new religion really struggles with is grace. It's very, very difficult for, um, for it to find that or any meaningful sense of redemption, because often the best it can get is, um, you know, you, you, you are tolerated, you're all right, you're, uh, um, you're excused for now. Um, what, what is often missing is uh, this idea, again, I'm leaning on Wolf here, of solidarity in sin. So the idea of the understanding that we're all sinners. Okay, that sin isn't just something them other people do. Sin isn't just an outside social thing, but it's an all of us thing. Now, that doesn't mean we have to say all sins are equal. That's not the requirement. But um, I think it's key that we find just the realization that all, we all, in some ways, we are, <laughs> we, we, we are sinful. And then I think what's also sometimes missing is the invitation to all. So if you think of the, um, the biblical storyline, um, you know, so uh, uh, salvation is an, is an offer to, um, to, to the whole human race. Everyone's invited. Um, whereas I think the new religion uh, sometimes does struggle with that. It likes to, um, it, it too easily excludes. Um, again, I'm uh, not doing it justice, but just to throw some ideas out there. I do still want to get, I'm on seven o'clock, so I still have a little bit of time um, to what can we do. Um, so just some ideas, and this is again just a fire hose of ideas. In some ways, we've got to hold some tensions. So <laughs> one, one uh, guideline might be listen, another one might be speak up. Do you see how we need to actually hold both? So on the one hand, we um, we need to listen, especially those of us who you know feel we we know a lot or we're quite opinionated, or we've heard this before, right? Is to is to really listen, um, and uh, not to have listening fatigue. But on the other hand, the speak up is about the silent middle. You know, perhaps there are some uh, situations in which speaking up is important. The one key. Uh, uh, complication in this, of course, is that I think most of us think we're in the middle. <laughs> All right, so um, before we speak up, just be, you know, being careful about what it is that we're speaking up about and that what we're doing is, um, isn't increasing polarization. Um, another tension might be, you know, on the one hand is, is um, 
being tolerant and actually i mean the biblical injunction is much more than tolerance isn't it it's love so i should have put love there um and that is key but that doesn't mean that anything goes okay it does it, it it's there's certainly still a place and needs to be a place for opposing injustice or evil and again now you can see how that is it, that's that's a conversation in itself right how do you navigate that how do you know um, which is which and how don't you uh, how do you not over declare evil too fast or over pronounce the other party as evil too quickly and then use it as an excuse for intolerance so that's really, i mean that is if we can get this one right i think we've won a lot already um remain curious uh especially with you know there are some things i just done the you know we can only bear so much reality and sometimes we just don't want to know anymore or we have compassion fatigue is there a way that we can remain curious i think this is actually also one of those balanced things because there's a um on the one hand remain curious but on the other hand don't let yourself be rabbit hole okay because that's what the social media algorithm does to you it sort of takes you deeper and deeper into into a particular hole so i don't mean that kind of curiosity so again it needs to be a a discerning curiosity um relationality being uh, functioning relationally um i think this is key right this, this is the project for me okay especially in traffic <laughs> to be prepared to believe that the other guy may not actually be an idiot or a monster okay maybe they're not stupid maybe they're not evil just even just is there a possibility even if i can just see that possibility maybe uh, um I'll be less uh, um, uh, playing the polarization game. Um, uh, to be able to will someone's good, even if you are triggered or outraged by their attitudes and actions, this is a hard one, right? So I'm just going to leave it there. Um, remembering that people change through persuasion and relationship, not humiliation or insult. Okay, so there's your social media guideline right there. and perhaps in summary it's um what if it's daily choices of embrace rather than um of exclusion um rehumanize the other tribe and again this is a tricky one right okay because but we do want to uh, we need to find not only the things that divide us but also um our, our common humanity but again in doing that what we're not trying to do is we're not trying to sugarcoat Uh, real problems and real differences and we do want to see and we do want to value difference so it's again a, a both and that we need to hold um get the poles right okay so there are polarities in life yeah, there is good there is evil there is truth versus falsehood but those are the right polarities um the wrong polarities is um there are good people and evil people do you see the difference Okay, the, we are all mixed bags the other person is not the enemy so use the right polarities uh draw larger circles that is uh, just something perhaps do i have the time let me quickly quote that um uh, lawyer and um activist pauli murray in um uh, some time ago uh said um i intend to destroy segregation by positive and embracing methods When my brothers try to draw a circle to exclude me, I shall draw a larger circle to include them. Where they speak out for the privileges of a puny group, I shall shout for the rights of all mankind. Okay, so uh, the challenge there being, I um, actually came across this from a, um, a presidential a Yale presidential speech. Um, how large will you draw your circle? Will you draw a circle that's large, inclusive? vibrant or will it be small and puny and privileged and um uh the three recommendations out of that speech were um you know make sure your circles are are, are truly large okay not just those who think like you and walk like you and talk like you draw as many circles as you can one circle will be your work um or maybe your group of friends but make sure you have other circles as well and then keep expanding your circles um and there again you you can see here the role of curiosity and imagination and also the role of of having to deal with our fear and and our suspicions of the other um breathe while you tweet <laughs> um 
uh, why, why do we suddenly believe online is a totally different set of relational rules? It's the same, you know, if you, if you wouldn't do it in person, don't do it online. You know, it's, it's, it's very simple in some ways. Uh, get exposed, um, seeking wider exposure. One thing that's interesting, though, is that that in itself, it turns out, um, I'm quoting one study here, um, isn't actually enough. So I can, I can sort of deliberately lead, uh, read uh, uh, articles or blogs by people who, uh, who are on the other side, who have uh, um, the opposing view. But in itself, that actually doesn't necessarily uh, um, make me less polarized. It can actually just reinforce my existing views. So I think what's also needed is not just, you know, reading, reading people's stuff that we don't personally know, but actually the personal uh, interactions, who we're friends with, who we talk to. Um, and also having the moral courage, uh, again, this is Wolf, um, of not only seeing the other person's view, but also almost like to try and step inside their view of how they see me. That's a scary one, right? How do you see me? Um, pursue wisdom. So a Desmond Tutu quote, don't raise your voice, improve your argument. Um, and along with that, you know, go, go deeper, do check your facts. Sorry, some of these are, um, are obvious. And in many ways, I suppose I'm just preaching to the converted, but maybe it's just good to remind ourselves of, of these things. Um, do complexity, do nuance. Um, you probably have heard of the idea of steel manning versus straw manning. So straw manning is to take the opposition's argument and uh, simplify it and distort it. And it's not, you know, in, into something that's not worth engaging with anymore, or not worth taking seriously. Steel manning is the opposite. It's basically what is the, uh, what is the other side's best argument? Okay. And then engaging with the, with the best version of that argument, not with the worst version of it. Um, disagree on standpoints, not identities, uh, where possible silent middle. Okay. Respectfully add options to the conversations. Many conversations may only, you know, you, uh, you may only see two options, just the binaries. Is there a third option and a fourth? And also don't be too quick to baptize or spiritualize your position, uh, to declare that God has said when, um, when perhaps God hasn't. <laughs> um, the hu humility, okay, about that log in my own eye. This is also key. And remember, humility, I think I got this from Tim Keller, is, isn't thinking less of myself, but thinking of myself less. Okay, so humility doesn't mean I need to badmouth myself. Humility just means I need to be able to listen more. That's all it means. Um, fruit of the Spirit, okay, some ancient wisdom for, for current times. And, um, uh, you know, think of that in terms of social media again, but not only. Uh, and fr the fruit of the spirit isn't gendered, it isn't color coded. Yeah, it's for everyone. Um, our view of self, being aware of myself, what triggers me, what conversations rather to get out of and not to have. Um, there may be that um, emotional intelligence. Um, knowing that we're made in God's image. That's what goes all the way down, right? And that is, that is key, being made in God's image and, and also being able to find myself secure in him. Lots more that can be said, but let me move on. Uh, on the worldview level, get sin, get grace, right? Sin is not something external. Sin is something that uh, besets all of us. Okay, it's a disease um, uh, from <laughs> that affects uh, uh, that's inside of all of us. And then also get get grace, um, because that is uh, so frequently if the if grace enters the conversation, uh, it's a totally different conversation, isn't it? And so, in conclusion, um, I want to say this carefully because I don't want to sound triumphalistic or, or, or something of that uh, order of magnitude. But in the Bible's description of reality, we have something really, really precious in terms of um, uh, how it puts grace at the very, very center uh, of reality. Um,
but uh, and how it's an invitation to everyone, but it's not an everything goes type of an invitation either. Okay, truth matters. So it does. It, it, there is a. It, it's very strong on on a, a particular stand um, on uh, that not all things are true and are good, um, but it is an invitation uh, to everyone. God is a God of embrace. You know, the um, the biblical storyline is a storyline of um, a God, a God uh, um, seeking to embrace those who have excluded him at great cost to himself, okay? uh, um, at, at huge self-sacrifice. And then we as those who, who seek him and follow him um, also then have that that mission, that uh, that that uh, demeanor um, of embrace rather than of exclusion. Good. I've even left us fifteen minutes to to chat. <laughs>